So thank you for uh, everyone for joining us. We are 72 participants, as I see. Um, we'll be talking for like maybe an hour, a, a, little, bit, a little bit more. You can uh, send some question on the, on the converser, but I'm not sure I will get all of them, of course, because I'll have to concentrate on what everybody is saying and reading and everything so but i'll try i'll try to to pass on your your, your questions um so uh, obviously the the webinar was uh, uh, planned on the black vote so black vote matters is the title and well after what happened uh last week we must say uh the, it's all the more relevant uh I, I think um, so. There will be a lot, of, uh, a lot to say after this election about the context, of course, the context of after the police brutality and racial injustice that led to numerous protests in the in the U.S. and in various U.S. cities. Uh, the context of a rising youth activism that is both in line and very different, uh, uh, of course, from from what happened in the past and. Last but not least, uh, the COVID contest, the COVID crisis that uh, has affected uh, communities of color in massive proportion uh, uh, compared to, to others. Uh, but there's also a lot to say about uh, how this election took place. Uh, there have been a lot of concern uh, before the, the election, before the, uh, this electoral process uh, about uh, vote suppression, mail-in ballots. We've seen that this was an issue. Um, this election somehow worked as a stress test for American democracy, and it seems to have passed, but uh, not without consequences, obviously. Uh, that is some of the question, uh, of course, we will address today with uh, our panel of uh, um, for, uh, for people, Audrey Celestine, uh, who is a political sociologist at the Université de Lille in France and uh, at the Institut Universitaire de France. You also have been a, a visiting professor at uh, New York University and uh, your research explores political mobilization by uh, Antillians in France and Puerto Ricans in the, in the US. Uh, Michael Dawson, um, you are a the John D. MacArthur Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Uh, your research interests are of, included um, African-American political behavior, identity and public opinion, uh, as well as uh, political effects of urban poverty and African-American political ideology. Um, Kathy Morgan Patterson, you lead the University Community Service Centers program at the University of Chicago, and so you know everything about this new kind of mobilization uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, your research uh, also explores uh, urban education, racial and, and economic stratification, and a lot of other subjects. Uh, so we'll talk about education also with you, if, uh, if, uh, if we may. And, Papandiai, uh, hello, you're a historian. You teach US history at Sciences Po Paris, and you specialize in African-American history. You also work uh, on the history and sociology of uh, Afro-descendants in France. I don't know if, we have, if we'll have the chance to talk about France, but uh, obviously it's pretty different from what's happening in the US. Uh, you've been a, a visiting professor also at New York University and uh, Northwestern University. Um, so I guess, as I was saying, my first question uh, will be about the black vote in this 2020 uh, uh, US election that took not one day, but one week. Um, there have been a, a historical turnout uh, during this election, uh, just like for the rest of the population, or have there been any specificity, Michael Dawson? Um, I'll start with you because you are the one who, who built all these models about uh, the black vote. Oh, I don't know if I built a model in 50 years. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's, there's a lot of things we need to break down. And one of the questions that came from the audience was, we can talk about the vote itself, but you also need to talk about mobilization when we talk about the vote. <clears throat> and the mo there's two types of mobilization. Um, one, we have seen uh, several panelists can speak to this for literally over a century is the extraordinary work that black women did to um, organize, mobilize, turn out people, get people to the polls, um, and to politicize and educate as well. Um, so, um, and that was a, we see the effects quite clearly in places like Georgia. The Democratic Party is depending on black women in Georgia to, to save the Senate uh, from Republican control. Um, and 
we see the, saw the same thing in Detroit. We saw the same thing in Philadelphia. We saw the same thing. The other thing that people don't want to talk about, well, a lot of people do. I'm being a little bit facetious, but um, the Bush campaign targeted at Black and Latinx men and relatively successfully. Um, so Black men have been moving to the right successfully over a number of electoral cycles. And according to one poll, it was nearly 20% of Black men voted for Trump. Um, and I, our colleague, Kathy Cohen at the University of Chicago um, runs a survey called Gen Forward with a number of, of colleagues. And the number of percentage of non-white men voting for, young, young uh, non-white men voting for Trump was much larger than, than expected. And partly this is due to um, the Trump administration targeting young men of color in general, um, going after rappers for like 50 Cent and Ice Cube, Kanye, et cetera. But it's also, uh, I'll just say it, a certain type of toxic masculinity um, appeals across at least racial and ethnic divides. Um, and the Trump administration was much more um, targeted in trying to appeal to that. Uh, fortunately, I would say due to the efforts of other black men, but particularly black women, that was overwhelmed by the number of black people coming out against Trump. But it's uh, something to be pay attention to going forward. Uh, Kathy Morgan Patterson, you you were nodding. <laughs> well, I adore Michael. Um, but yes, uh, every everything he's saying is spot on. I think Stacey Abrams is a powerhouse in Georgia. I mean, mm -hmm. we see her work, um, and we we hopefully see that sort of reverberating in multiple settings. As Michael said, um, the Black community has a long history of this kind of work, right? Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, these things aren't new to us. Um, but I think for most of us, we were surprised at how close this was. I mean, like, um, you know, racism, if you will, like exists. But I think most people did not expect the race to be as close as it was. So even though we are seeing a Biden-Harris win, there's a lot of work to be done in America to sort of um, disentangle a lot of this stuff and think about it. Um, I also want to call attention to a lot of First Nations people, like in Arizona, who came out and voted for Biden. That was also a space where we saw um, concerted effort from populations to come out and put those votes. But Michael, similar to you, I did see a statistic that about, I think it was like a third is what I heard, a black men did in fact vote for Trump. So Papandiaia, uh, as we were saying, uh, there, there's this uh, uh, massive turnout that uh, obviously was uh, in favor of uh, Joe Biden with this uh, slight uh, uh, comment uh, by uh, Kathy and Michael that, say, that are saying, yes, but we can see 20 to 30 percent of uh, black men who voted for, uh, for Trump. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's uh, also when looking at the whole uh, African-American, um, I mean, the, the Trump vote, it's about 12. We can say that about 12 percent of African-Americans voted for Trump, which uh, seems like a lot. Uh, although when looking at the history of uh, um, uh, voting for the Republicans among African-Americans, it's, it's fairly classic. If you look at, uh, for example, the 2004 uh, presidential election, George W. Bush got 11%. So it's, you know, it's, it's fairly similar. Of course, uh, 2008 and 2012 are, are, are different for obvious reasons because of Obama's candidacy. But anywhere between eight and 12% and is what the Republicans usually make um, uh, among African-American voters. So that's one thing. On one side, you can say it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's standard, it, uh, uh, it's very classic. On the other side, of course, uh, Trump jumped from 8% to 12% uh, in four years. That's a 50% increase, which uh, is um, clearly uh, significant. And as, um, as Michael uh, said, uh, there are uh, elements that appeal to African-American uh, males. Um, and I was, when you were talking, Michael, I was thinking of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Trump's connections with the world of hip hop, 
uh, it, it's it's a long history uh, that uh, Trump has courted this world for for decades for all kind of reasons, uh, business reasons in New York uh, and etc. So he has some connections uh, here, which uh, he uh, uh, pursued uh, throughout the years up to nowadays. We I think there are also another element. If you look at uh, the um, other minorities, such as uh, Latinos, for example, the, he, Trump did pretty well also with uh, the Latino vote. Uh, we're talking about a third of the Latino vote, which is a little higher than uh, expected. We're looking at also at um, uh, the LGBT, the, the gay and lesbian vote. Uh, we're talking about 28% of this vote, which is twice as much as in 2016. So we could very well, given the uh, very uh, homophobic uh, dimension of Trump's policies, you, we could also very well wonder why uh, so many gay and lesbians voted uh, for Trump. Uh, so we're talking about something when uh, looking at minorities in a broad sense, that is uh, intriguing in some ways. Here, here an idea I want to uh, throw before ending my, uh, the, this uh, introduction. Um, when looking at, uh, let's say, uh, a gay uh, voter who voted for Trump, we should think of his uh, multiple identities. We are talking about someone who is homosexual, who has all reasons to vote against Trump. But this person could be, let's say, a banker or could be anything else with um, class interest. This person could have you know, other identities. And, it, and it's very similar when looking at uh, African-Americans. For example, in, in the South, and I have friends in Alabama, African-American friends in Alabama, who are, um, whose families are conservative. Um, from uh, on many issues uh, like abortion, etc., they are very religious, and there's American people may be fully aware of uh, Trump's uh, uh, racist and, and xenophobic policies. On the other side, uh, they agree with him on a number of issues, such as uh, abortion, for example, with the recent appointment of a new judge at the Supreme Court. So there is this whole array of uh, issues among minority voters. Uh, race is very important, but it does not always um, compensate for other factors linked to class interest, linked to uh, religious uh, involvement, linked to many other issues which make the black vote uh, of course, while being solidly democratic, but a little more unstable than one might think at first sight. Thank you, uh, Papa, and we'll come back uh, to this uh, intersectional approach, uh, so to speak, uh, because uh, obviously it's, uh, it's an important uh, uh, explanation of what, uh, of what we saw uh, last, uh, last Tuesday, but Audrey, um, Audrey Celestine, I wanted to, uh, to, to hear you about this first question, uh, this uh, massive turnout and how it played uh, for, for instance, for the, the black men who voted in a uh, considerable proportion for, for, for Donald Trump. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I totally agree with, um, with what Pap just said. Uh, it's really important when considering um, minorities to understand that a number of elements are going to um, impact the way they vote. Um, and it's something that we tend not to totally grasp from France, where we are reluctant to talk about race, but when it comes to the US, we see the black vote without understanding that actually operating a form of sociology of what it means, of what racial politics mean. It's not just black people voting for this or that candidate. It's actually uh, political behaviors that are built um, through history because of a number of dynamics and in a, a large number of cases for black people, well, race and racism are going to be important elements, but it's going to uh, play differently in local elections. It's going to play differently during primaries within the Democratic Party. Uh, we are in a system in which there are two major parties and 
of course, a number of everything that we have in France, where we have this multiplication of political parties in which we can have tendencies that are going to be um, uh, different, are going to be all within one single uh, party. I actually, I don't work on electoral politics, I work on social movements. And I started by working on Puerto Ricans in, uh, in New York. And of course, when you look at the history, a number of political behaviors of Puerto Ricans in New York are actually pretty similar to black people in the New York area. But they are probably because of history, because of a history of mobilizations together, of competition as well, but of common mobilizations. But if you just move south and you go to Florida, you're going to have more recent waves of uh, people who arrive, who don't necessarily have the same interest, who don't come from the same economic background, who don't see migration the same way, you will have gener uh, generational um, differences as well. And that's why it's something that we talked about a few days ago about the Latino vote. Uh, it's both um, sometimes annoying to hear about the Latino vote because we know that being a Mexican in California is clearly not the same than being a Dominican in New York. And at the same time, there is, uh, there are strong incentives within the American political system to kind of play the Hispanic card because you're going, your voice is going to be heard more uh, if you present yourself as a member of a larger community. But I think that for us, when we do political sociology, it's important to look at this more local dynamics and to go back to what um, Michael and Kathy were saying earlier, it's true that the work of mobilizations by local activists, by regional, by national is, is key. And we can, we, we, we can see it in Arizona and of course in Georgia where um, um, Stacey Abrams has been pivotal and it's going to be the case in January as well, that there's this very strong effort. It's not just the demographic that are changing and that's, it's a way to interpret this uh, demographic changes and to act upon them to go and look and and go and see the establishment of the democratic party and say okay we need to um, um, put resources there because things are going to change but we need to get people um, out in order to vote we need to do something we need to address the issue of voter suppression etc so we see that there's if i had to summarize what uh, i mean it's on, on the one hand it's very important to sociologize i don't know if i can that word even exists in English, yeah, to sociologize the way we look at racial politics in order to really make sense of the political behaviors of the minorities. And um, on the other hand, look at the very, um, how, uh, how should I put it? Uh, all of the political efforts to actually organize people so they vote, so they're mobilized, so they get registered and to also go to court if necessary and this kind of thing. And that's exactly what's been happening in places like Georgia. I don't really know what you want to react to because there's two different things in what Audrey just said and they are equally important and so we come to both of them but uh, uh, maybe Michael do you, do you want first to 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 comment what uh, Audrey just said about uh, uh, the structure uh, of uh, American politics that tends to 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 we had the chance to 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 have an interview a, a few a few days ago that was published in AOC the the, the newspaper that is a, a partner in partnership with uh, with the Chicago University for this conversation and, and you were explaining me uh, that uh, because of the bipartisanship uh, the, the the black vote is, tends to go to to uh, to the Democrats, but it would play differently if there were more uh, more parties in uh, at stake. And after we maybe we'll talk about uh, this idea of uh, the importance of mobilization and local uh, local movements. Thank you. I, yeah, I want to follow up on what um, the other speakers have said because I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> One thing gets directly um, we know that the two party system homogenizes a lot of po uh, populations, <clears throat> not actually, but in terms of how their votes are expressed, it's quite limited. <clears throat> so diversity within communities is often lost, uh, particularly in, in large national elections. Um, and there's two ways that was um, managed, the third diversity was manifested in two, in two ways. One of the mistakes that the Democrats made this time around that uh, the Republicans got right is that the Democratic campaign, I've talked to a couple of, of my doctoral students who um, are from these communities and from places like Texas and Florida. Um, there's sort of like one Hispanic message fits all. Um, while the Republican Party was getting Venezuelan speakers, getting Cuban speakers, 
talking about issues of socialism to those communities specifically, I mean, very targeted as saying, we're speaking to your concerns and your voice and your language. And the Democratic Party wasn't doing that. Um, and in terms of the sort of, not the sort of, but in terms of the appeal that Trump had, not just to the hip hop community, but to um, uh, young black people across gen gender to some degree and black men in particular, one of the things that I've written with Megan Francis about is about the effect of neoliberalism in black communities. And the entire emphasis over the last months of the campaign was, we're gonna invest in black communities and allow entrepreneurs to get ahead like I did. And that was an influential message, the so-called platinum plan. Um, that, was a, that was a message that uh, after years of neoliberalism under both political parties, uh, was a very specific, a very was very um, effective in some sectors of the black community. So one of the types of diversity we we don't talk about besides our very types of demographic diversity is also ideological diversity in these communities that we miss. And one of the things that's happened in the black community is neoliberalism has become a much stronger force over the last twenty or thirty years. Kathy, you want to elaborate on what just said, uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, very little. Um, I think he hit it beautifully. I would just say that you know. Um, sometimes I think about it in this way, sort of to the point of intersectional identities that Black people are just as complex as any other group. So we're just sort of coming now to allow them to sort of own that. And with that complexity comes the, um, the right to make poor decisions that don't always match your interests. I mean, that, that's what I see. Um, to Michael's point, yes, it was a concerted effort to get Lil Wayne. I mean, like, it was very strategic in the people that they sought out and then the messages that came out from those people in doing it. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, that whatever the, a third of Black men did it for that, all did it for that reason, but I think neoliberalism is a great way to understand it as a broader concept, um, because that is so much of what those people in particular embody. Um, so, yeah, I agree completely. And, and just uh, if, if we talk about um, the specific mobilization for, uh, uh, for this turnout and for having uh, the, the, well, for building the black vote, so to speak. Um, uh, would you say that what has just explained uh, Michael about uh, how Republicans uh, uh, managed to talk specifically to such and such communities is in opposition to this more uh, uh, ground local way to that maybe the Democrat part, Democratic Party is using to, uh, you know, like uh, community service and, and the way they, they use it to, to talk to, to, to the black communities and have them vote Democrats, so to speak? So is there a, uh, an opposition between the two and, and is one winning on the others or? You yeah. know, I haven't given that much thought. Um, so Michael, maybe if you have a, a thought, I think both of them pander in ways that I don't necessarily agree with in regards to neoliberalism. I mean, I don't think Republicans own neoliberal. I think both sides kind of do that dance. Um, I think to Michael's point, I have seen some differentiation in the way the Democratic Party um, in Illinois in particular, was addressing certain populations, but I think more broadly, um, they don't uh, generalize it because of the assumptions that we make about black and brown people, that they um, are these sort of monoliths, that they don't have this um, complexity among them. So yeah, I think so. Michael? Um, I would say that there's a couple of things. I mean, there's a little bit of arrogance, certainly in the National Democratic Party, both during the Clinton campaign and, and um, during the, the current campaign with um, Biden um, that take both the black and the Latinx vote for granted. Um, I remember talking to black national, I mean, member, uh, leadership of, of unions that had millions of voters, primarily uh, black and brown uh, union members, um, and being told in March of 2016 that the Clinton campaign wasn't putting any money into black and brown neighborhoods. Uh, oh, and guess what? So Pennsylvania flips, Michigan flips. <laughs> um, so I think there's um, an arrogance of, of presumed familiarity that the Republican Party can't do. It doesn't make the Republican Party right. Well, one thing I want to say about what Coffee said that was I couldn't agree more. Neoliberalism has been the official policy of both parties now for well over a generation. So this is there's a bipartisan consensus <laughs> around neoliberalism. Um, but it also means that certain type of appeals that Republicans make that, um, for example, one of the figures that's becoming, and this Pap can talk to this, who's becoming very, very um, popular in black community, at least some parts of black communities, is Booker T. Washington. 
And that's very consistent with the type of neoliberal entrepreneurship. We don't need to deal with politics. That's not the way things get done in this country. Uh, Pat, uh, there's this uh, so this historical um, movement uh, that maybe uh, was just uh, describing uh, Michael uh, th that uh, uh, Democrats are taking uh, the black vote for, for for granted. Of course, for, for for Joe Biden, it was especially the case after four years of uh, of Donald Trump, and maybe also because we've not talked about uh, Kamala Harris uh, um, being the 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 uh, on the ticket, being being the, the vice president uh, elected now. Uh, how how did it how did this play uh, according to you uh, this choice of Kamala Harris and and the and the ideas that uh, the black vote where it was uh, granted for uh, for yeah. Joe Biden? Yeah, the black vote is clearly taken uh, for granted by the Democrats. Remember, uh, Biden was um, literally salvaged uh, during the primaries uh, when in uh, South Carolina. Uh, the African-American voters uh, voted for him when he was not in a good situation a year ago when uh, uh, representative, what's his name, Cly Clyburn, I don't remember the name of this uh, senior member of Congress in South Carolina, this uh, African-American uh, important uh, 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 member of Congress who uh, sided with Biden at a time when Biden's candidacy was was uh, jeopardized, to say the least, and he was not in a good situation. Uh, it, it, it suggests to me that um, uh, often, um, well, first, Biden was not, no one voted with enthusiasm for Biden. It seems to me that it was first and foremost uh, anti-Trump, and, and a lot of people would have voted for anyone uh, who could uh, defeat uh, Trump. But beyond that, uh, it seems that there is, a, let's say, a, a, a historical dimension behind the black vote, which is linked to a history of uh, discrimination and discre in a history of, of domination, which is that people tend to vote in a defensive way. They, they vote for the least problematic person. They vote as a way to avoid the worst. Uh, in many ways, um, and uh, in, in, it was especially the case uh, the, this time, uh, even if Biden was the vice president of Obama, no one uh, voted for Biden with the kind of enthusiasm that, that was so obvious in 2008 and, and 2012. So we are back in some ways to uh, the usual uh, uh, political situation when African-American electors vote for a Democratic candidate because he is the one uh, most likely to pay a little attention to uh, what uh, um, African-American uh, voters are uh, interested into, but uh, they don't vote with a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, and a lot of uh, uh, energy, so to speak. Uh, it, it may be, it, it, it's mostly defensive, uh, it, it, it seems to me. Um, so uh, this case, in this case, uh, the, it was especially true with, uh, with, uh, Joe, with Joe Biden. Um, however, um, I, I was in Chicago four years ago uh, and uh, at this time, and I remember talking to people in, uh, in the South Side, uh, and this, they, they were telling me that they saw no one, uh, you know, doing some uh, uh, door knocking, um, grassroots activities. The Democrats were no, nowhere to be seen in Chicago, while Chicago can be seen as a, a, a very obvious uh, democratic uh, area, but unlike previous times, uh, th there was nothing. So I'm not sure of what happened this time, but I, I, I believe that things uh, changed um, between 2016 and 2020 with s more efforts being done at the grassroots uh, level. But to get back to my main point, uh, I think that uh, this time again, with some exceptions, possibly uh, 
uh, in, in with Stacey Abrams in, in, in Georgia, we're back to the kind of, you know, uh, support for democratic candidates without um, too much enthusiasm and belief in the possibilities uh, for, for change. Uh, so that's what I call uh, a defensive vote. Audrey Sestin, would you agree with this uh, idea, uh, um, given the fact that you, you told us that uh, you were not a, a political, uh, <laughs> uh, an electoral specialist, but more uh, uh, working on the sociology of, uh, of these groups? Uh, would you say that uh, after, of course, uh, eight years of uh, Barack Obama, the enthusiasm is, uh, is gone? <laughs> Well, I think that there are, uh, yeah, I agree with the fact that there was no real, I mean, I was in um, teaching in the US like ex exactly one year ago, and it, I don't think that there was a great enthusiasm for Joe Biden, and I think it's fair to say that, and that most people would agree. Uh, and I also think that there are this, there are a number of dynamics within the Democratic Party right now, and that they are going to have to sort a number of things out. I'm not sure they're going to do that, but we are both in this situation where there's no enthusiasm for the uh, candidate, but people felt that he was probably likely to win, to drag the moderate voters, independent voters, etc. that it was not scary. And at the same time, the most dynamic part of the <laughs> Democratic Party right now is a, uh, our candidates that are often backed by social movements uh, that are sometimes former organizers. And I, I think that people have very mixed feelings about what's going on in Georgia because yes, there's clearly a possibility to flip the Senate uh, uh, in early um, January um, with uh, the two senatorial races that are going to have runoffs. But at the same time, the person who's kind of pushing the effort, Stacey Abrams, who, who we've been talking about her a lot, um, might not be good news for a part of the Democratic Party because she's also pushing, I mean, um, organizations on the ground that are might be more on the left than a number of people within the party would like it to be. So I think that there are a number of, and actually the issues have started to be raised uh, on TV with uh, some um, um, democratic candidates uh, saying that it's actually the the two the radicals of the party that have made them uh, lose their seats. So I think that uh, in terms of ideology and general strategy, for the future of the party and the future of its political in, in investments uh, in uh, a number of, of areas, there are going to there's a lot of work and a lot of very difficult uh, discussions and disputes that are going to happen within um, within the Democratic Party. And I think that the whole all of the results, even when even those that are temporary that we just got, um, are a proof of that. Of that. <laughs> there's a lot of work um, for the coming years. The Democratic Party have a lot of work and sorting uh, and must, and must uh, sorting things out, uh, says uh, Audrey. Uh, Cathy, you, you agree? Uh, I, see you, uh, I see you nodding. Maybe that's where we, uh, we come to speak uh, about uh, the context of uh, after uh, maybe uh, after a few months of, uh, of mobilization, after the death of, of George Floyd, obviously, and and after a few years of mobilization, uh, uh, if you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, um, uh, is there um, a, a, ground, a, a, a grassroots mobilization that is more uh, to the left, so, so, so to speak, and that is uh, moving uh, the Democratic Party in, in, in some way? Um, I'll just, yeah, sure, I'll just hop in really quickly and say, and I think, um, Clara, I know it's hard for you to see and uh, do all your magic. So Clara actually submitted a question that's very much in line with what you're asking now. And I'll sort of use that um, to go into it. But she mentioned Charlene Carruthers and, and obviously the work of BYP, Black Lives Matter, I think it's very uh, similar. And that, you know, I don't ever remember Black Lives Matter, for example, proclaiming Biden Harris as like their can I don't, I don't ever remember, I don't believe that happened. But what I've always heard them talk about is accountability. So like, even if you go to their site now or listen to what their leaders are saying, they're saying, we simply want to hold people accountable. Great, it's great if they won, but if they win and they do nothing for us, then that's not a win. 
And so I think what's really important that's gonna happen now, and this is what Claire is asking is, um, is, is like she said, Charlene was taken to the streets immediately to protest. That is very much in line with a black um, tradition of organizing, of the Latin tradition of organizing. And so that's where I think attention will go to now. Um, and you know, if you look at, and I, and I like um, the understanding of them as um, sort of, I don't wanna say lesser of two evils because that's not what I mean, but like if you look at the history of Harris's um, work with like incarceration, there's issues. Um, if you look at um, Biden's work with or, um, his um, sort of overseeing the hearings for Anita Hill, there's issues. So I think we sort of voted for these people knowing that there are issues, but I think we're hoping, um, and I think that is probably one of the greatest strengths of the black community that spans either side is a hope, a deep hope, um, a possibility, an ability to improvise, um, and an ability to hold people accountable. Um, so yes, we won because of our vote, especially as I see the organizing work of black women taking this, you won because of those votes. Now let's see how you put that into action. So that's what I'm sort of uh, paying the most attention to now after January 20th. Michael, uh, there were strong words from uh, Joe Biden uh, on his speech, uh, his first uh, speech as a uh, president elect, but uh, it will be taken accountable for, for his action more than his word. So if I understand Kathy. Well, I couldn't agree more with her. I mean, first of all, um, I, guess I, I guess I can go someplace where she wouldn't go. I'll call it the, the lesser of two evils. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and if you look in the, if you, I mean, talking during the primary season, among in the black communities that I was, there was no enthusiasm for Kamala Harris. Um, and that was because of her role in putting black mothers in jail um, um, over relatively trivial issues. So I think there was an enthusiasm this time in, the, in black electoral mobilizing, but it was to save humanity from uh, a second Trump term. Um, this was uh, the most energetic defensive campaign I, I've ever seen in my, in my life. And one of the reasons I think there was a difference between 2016 on the South Side of Chicago and many other places in 2020 is not necessarily because of what the Democratic Party did at the national level, but because of organizers um, in all sorts of different political views within Black communities said, we cannot allow this to happen again, whether it was union, unions organizing, teachers and parents organizing, block clubs organizing, left forces and Black youth organizing. So a lot of what we saw in terms of turnout wasn't necessarily due to the Democratic Party itself. Papandia, this uh, mobilization and this uh, way of um, organizing uh, the, the Black vote is uh, obviously quite different from what happened with the civil rights movement or, or the Black Power, but it has also some similarities, I guess. Uh, uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this? Uh, history uh, and, and how it plays now. We could very well think of the, um, um, mobile, the grassroots campaigns for uh, voting rights that uh, took place in the early 1960s in the Deep South when uh, activists from the, the SNEAK um, you know, um, did some very courageous work in, in the Black Belt, for example, in Alabama or Mississippi. Uh, trying to unfranchise uh, African American uh, uh, voters or, or, or citizens, uh, uh, and this was these were dangerous times. Of course, you, you could die for that. You could be killed by the white supremacist and the uh, the Klan, and many died actually doing that in uh, in Selma and elsewhere in the South. So there is indeed. Uh, um, a, a, a tradition of uh, activism for enfranchisement that was beautifully revived in many ways by Stacey Abrams in, in Georgia. I'm looking forward to learning more actually about wh what she did. I've read a few papers here and there, but I want to read detailed studies of how she organized in Georgia to, um, to um, Bring people to the voting booth and uh, and, uh, and and make sure that people have their uh, have their rights, their voting rights, which is not a picnic in uh, in, in Georgia and elsewhere, 
because of the uh, Republican Party efforts uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, disenfranchise uh, thousands and, and thousands using all kinds of tricks uh, with ID, um, uh, ID with, um, with photo IDs, I mean, uh, and, and, and so many, many things that are taking place in, in, uh, in the South, in, in, from Texas to uh, the Carolinas, and also in, in some states in, in the Midwest. So there is um, something I would, uh, I would uh, very much like to explore, that is the, 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 the connections between these uh, grassroots efforts, which we have seen in, in Georgia, and the, the history of uh, activism for voting rights in, uh, in the South. And it'd be interesting to uh, have a close look at, the, uh, at, this, at this long history of uh, activism. Uh, and, uh, and I think it would uh, shed an interesting light on what uh, St Stacey Abrams, for example, has succeeded in doing in, uh, in Georgia. Michael, maybe you have uh, some something to say about what uh, just Pap uh, asked about this uh, this link between mobilization and uh, and what's happening uh, right now, and maybe with this uh, uh, historical perspective, uh, as I was asking, uh, the, maybe the difference uh, and the like of, of uh, what happened decades ago with uh, the um, uh, civil rights movements, for instance. I think there are, there are some similarities um, that are important. One is deep independent organizing around both specific issues as well as around electoral politics and the close linkages between them. Um, the deep organizing in both in the South and outside the South in urban areas and rural areas is another similarity. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> Particularly, um, the, the, I would say that the mobilization of the past several years have been led by the two main forces have been organized black women across generation and black youth organizing. And that's certainly similar to what we saw during the civil rights and black power, power movements. Um, what's different is that there are the political differences within the black community are more acute, partly due to neoliberalism, partly due to the fact that there are more class divisions in the black community today than there were 50, 60 years ago at the height of the civil rights and black power movements. We, there's not the gigantic unified structure of Jim Crow that I can be a banker, I can be a shoeshine boy, but I don't like Jim Crow. We know this. <laughs> um, so there's not, there's a, the politics is more complicated, more difficult to, to unify politics. There's more, there's more interest involved, but there are some similar similarities in terms of what the leading forces in the mobilization, the structure of that mobilization. Uh, 